the meaning of dharma and how to incorporate it into our daily lives. The subject I was asked to speak about is science and spirituality. One of my favorite stories is a story of three men who are stranded on a boat in the middle of the ocean. And as they're stranded on this boat, they've done what sometimes young children do in a bed or in their bedroom, where they've drawn these invisible imaginary lines in the boat so that each of the three men has his own portion of the boat. And one day, two of the men look over into the third portion, and they realize that it's filling with water. It's flooding. And they scream, plug up the hole. It's flooding. We're going to drown. And the third man says, oh, don't worry. It's only flooding in my part of the boat. Now, of course, invisible, imaginary lines or not, if any part of a boat is flooding and leaking, the whole boat is going to sink. And yet in our lives, that's what we've done. We've drawn these imaginary, invisible lines between this is my physical life, this is my career life or my academic life, this is my social life, and this is my spiritual life. And we tend to pay a lot of attention and give a lot of attention to our physical life, our career life, our academic life, and our social life. And we tend to let our spiritual life start to fill with water and leak and flood. And we think, no problem. It's only the spiritual part. The problem is that like in the boat, the lines are only invisible. They're imaginary. If any part of our life, particularly the spiritual part, if it starts to leak, the whole boat sinks. And one of the reasons that we've been giving so little attention to our spiritual life has to do with science. We've become so focused. And science is wonderful. Science has given us everything. The problem is that when we try to apply the scientific method, when we try to apply scientific principles to God and to spirituality, it doesn't work. What does science say? Science says if it's measurable, if it's quantifiable, if it's tangible on some level, then it exists. Then it's valid. And of course, spirituality and God are not measurable and quantifiable or tangible in any way that we know. And so I can't tell you how many homes I've been in recently all over the world in which the youth say, I don't believe in God. Why do we have to go to temple? Why do we have to pray? What's the importance? How can you prove it? And the tragedy of this is that you're trying to put square pegs into a round hole. And it doesn't work. A hundred years ago, if you said to anybody, our brains function by electricity. Everything that takes place in our body takes place because of a series of electrical impulses in the brain. They would have laughed. They would have thought you were crazy. The brain, electrical. But once MRIs and PET scans and CAT scans and all of these measuring Equipment and machines become available, suddenly we can see, yes, the brain is electrical. But a hundred years ago, before we knew that, if the electrical impulses in your brain stopped, what would happen? You would die. Or you'd be at least brain dead. It doesn't matter whether we could measure it or understand it or believe it. Those electrical impulses in the brain are keeping us alive. Whether we have an MRI or a PET scan or a CAT scan to prove it or not. 
in the days before Newton discovered gravity, was it safe to walk off a building? Of course not. Just because we didn't yet know what it was called, we didn't know how to measure it, it would still take our life. And in the same way, spirituality gives us our life. Just because we can't measure it yet, just because we don't understand it in those constructs, and yet it applies and affects so many areas of our life. I'll give you just a few examples as time is short. Duke University, one of the most famous research-based universities in America, conducted a study several years ago in which they did a longitudinal study, 10 years study, of thousands of people. And they measured every aspect of these people's lives. Eating habits, living habits, everything. And what they found at the end of 10 years is that people who regularly attended a place of worship were 25% less likely to die of any cause during the 10 years of the study than people who did. What's happening here? We're not giving out multivitamins as prasad. We're not running medical camps side by side our temples. It's not that the air is pure. It's not that our bandharas are somehow more organic. What's going on? Dartmouth University, another very famous, very renowned university, did a study of patients who had suffered from a heart attack. As those patients entered the hospital, when they did the intake, in addition to all of their medical questions, they also asked, how religious are you? And at the end of six months, what they found is that people who had said, there were three choices, very religious, some are religious, and not religious. People who said they were not religious, 11% of them had died within six months after the study. Now that's not unusual. You can ask somebody like our doctor, Kube, or any doctors. 11% is actually very standard for people having had the first heart attack. But within six months, they will have another fatal heart attack. What about the people who said they were very religious? What percent of them do you think that? Zero. Zero. What is going on here? What these studies tell us is that spirituality, a connection to God, faith, are playing a huge role in our lives. A role as important in our lives as gravity plays in the life of somebody who steps off the building. We may not understand it, but it's there. And yet, look at what's happening. In America, the top 10 medicines that are prescribed in America are antidepressants, anti-anxiety, sleeping pills, and Viagra. <clears throat> We've put people in outer space. Science has achieved immeasurable feats, but we're running back. Now we have to take pills to be with animals. We have to take pills to go to sleep at night. We have to take pills to drag ourselves out of bed in the morning. We have to take pills to go to eat. Pills to go to the toilet. What is going on? We're running in the wrong direction. We're running after an illusion after a mirage, an illusion that says that happiness and peace and meaning and fulfillment in life are to be found in external things. They're to be found in having a lot of money. They're to be found in luxury. They're to be found in that level of success. And running after that mirage, it's like if you're in the desert and you run after a mirage of water. 
Neither you find the water, nor you can find your way back on the path. So they're diverting us off of the path, the path of spirituality, which is really the path that can provide us with peace, with joy, with meaning. I want to just take another minute or two and share with you one more very important story. Because this, this is what's happening in our lives. There was a woman, and outside one night, under a bright street light, she was on her hands and knees, and she was searching in the road for something. And a holy man walked by, and he said, Mother, can I help you? What are you looking for? She said, I've lost my key. Can you help me find it? So he said, sure. He also got down on his hands and knees and he helped her search. After some time, he said, Mother, where exactly did you lose your key? Oh, I left it in the house, she said. Then why are you searching outside? In the road, he asked. Oh, she said, because inside it's very dark. There's no light. But outside there's this very bright street light. So I'm searching here under this light. He said, Mother, go back inside. It may be dark. It may take some time. But you will find your key. An army can't help you find it outside. And in our lives, we're searching for peace. We're searching for happiness. We're searching for meaning and fulfillment. But we're searching in the wrong place. It happens to be very bright in a shopping center. It happens to be very bright outside in the malls. But we need to turn back in. Back, as Dr. Dubé has said, as Buddha Swamiji has said, back to the Dharma. That is what will provide us with the true path in our lives. And you, you the youth, are the ones who need to guide the rest of the world. You need to show it to them. This conference, this convention, these organizations that are here to support you are to show you where the path is. But then your job is to show others. Last, there was a father, a businessman, and he came home from work one day. And he was sitting in his chair reading the newspaper. And he had a young son who came up to him and who kept trying to talk to him and try to play with him. And his dad said, yes, yes, in a few hours I'll play. But the boy kept coming, kept coming. And finally the father tore a page out of the newspaper. And he tore that page into lots of little pieces. And he handed it to his son. And he said, look. It's a jigsaw puzzle. On this page is a map of the world. As soon as you put this map back together, tape it up, bring it back to me, and then I will play with you. And the father thought now he has at least several hours of time that he can sit and read the paper. But within five minutes, the boy was back. Map taped perfectly together, handed it to his father, and his dad said, what? But you don't even know geography. How did you do this? And the boy said, dad, on the back of the map of the world, there was a picture of a child. I just put the child and the world automatically came to That is your job. Take your dharma. Use your dharma to put yourselves together and then go out and put the world.